This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome once again from Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, is Evan The show is live, as always, and we broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live right now on YouTube with our whole show, as always, available on demand on our YouTube channel. Today, we look at the aftermath of what could be one of the worst disasters on the African continent in recent memory. Numbers vary, but 67 South Africans are still reported to have died in the church building collapse in Nigeria. In business, consumer inflation quickened in South Africa, and we'll put a story to those numbers a bit later. And we continue to look at Tourism Month and South Africa's outlook. But first, let's get today's news from Katrine Malone. Well, hello and welcome to Newsroom. I'm Katri Malan and let's take a look at the top stories this morning. South, Africa's, uh, South Africans whose relatives have been visiting televangelist TV Joshua's church in Lagos, Nigeria, have again descended on Johannesburg's Oatambu International Airport for news about their loved ones. A team of 10 experts left South Africa for Nigeria last night to assist in the recovery and repatriation of bodies following the collapse of a church building in the capital. President Jacob Zuma announced on Tuesday night that 67 South Africans died when the building collapsed nearly a week ago. He experienced bad things like flowers, other things, but this one is more shocking. He is also saddened about the situation, but he is on our side. Staying in Nigeria and Boko Haram insurgents have been blamed after at least 13 people died during a shootout between police and suspected suicide bombers at a teacher training college in northern Nigeria yesterday. Most of the victims were in a lecture hall inside the Kanu College where two gunmen opened fire on students. President Goodluck Jonathan extended his condolences to the victims' families after what he called a dastardly attack. Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf hopes that the U.S. President Barack Obama's decision to send 3,000 troops to West Africa to battle the worst Ebola outbreak on the record would spur other countries to do the same. Johnson Sirleaf says her government is fighting back against the deadly virus, which has claimed the lives of some 1,300 people in Liberia. Then back in South Africa, a number of schools and businesses remain closed at Krabo in the Western Cape following three days of protests. Residents are demanding proper housing, sanitation and running water. Residents clashed with police again and a section of the fire station was set alight. The mayor says he will meet the community representatives again tomorrow. And then international headlines. Just hours before Scotland's independence referendum, the fate of the United Kingdom rests on hundreds of thousands of wavering Scottish voters. In an intense final day of campaigning yesterday, leaders of both sides try to convince Scots to seize the reins of history in a vote that has divided families and friends. While the outcome looks too close to call, the pro-independence camp has seen support surge in recent weeks as the no size lead shriveled away. That top story and more all available on our Newsroom Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Yevon, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Katrine. Now, relatives of South African victims from the Nigeria building collapse disaster say they are disappointed with government's slow pace at assisting them. About 20 people are waiting at Oar Tambo's International Arrivals Terminal, hoping that their loved ones are on this morning's flight back from Lagos. Now, for the latest, we cross to our reporter, Gillian Pile, who's been waiting at our Tambo International Airport for the arrival of two aircraft from Nigeria. Very good morning to you, Gillian. A very good morning to you, Yevon. Yes, um, the two aircraft that you're talking about, it has, um, you know, arrived here at our Tambo International Airport. But when we arrived here, the scene was one of desperation, a real, a real sense of anxiousness and uneasiness among South Africans who converged here at the arrivals terminal. Many have left. Um, those two uh, flights that we're talking about, the one arrived at 5 to, um, five, to 5 and the other one 10 past 6. Um, that scene, when 
when South Africans, you know, disembarked the plane, moving through the arrivals terminal, it was really one of, of in, an emotional reunion with their loved ones. But for those who, who really haven't received any word, it's, it's a sense of them being left in limbo, really, um, as you said in the intro there, Yabin, um, they're not really getting, they feel they're not getting any answers, any support um, from, from the authorities on, on the whereabouts, on the safety, um, or even just a little bit of hope um, about, about their loved ones. We spoke to a gentleman who has come here for a second consecutive day with his brothers. They've traveled all the way from Whitbank. They haven't gone to work. He, they say they can't sleep, they can't eat. Um, the, the last conversation that they had with their mom was last week, Wednesday, when she, when she left South Africa for Nigeria. And he, he's, he just you know, related that raw emotional ordeal um, that many of us, you know, we can put ourselves in, in their shoes, what they're going through, not, not getting any word or having any um, communication with that loved one that, that was in that, or that is in that country. Um, you know, a real sense of desperation um, felt here among, among the relatives who, have, who, who wait for hours on end, standing at this terminal, um, hoping that they would see, see that face of that loved one walking through these doors. But for many, it wasn't the case today. Um, you know, that, that emotional a reunion of, of relief more than anything at, at this stage here at Oartambo International. Yeah, but Jillian, uh, just run us through the, uh, the numbers of people that are there that are seemingly directly involved. There, there's a lot of speculation and uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, misrepresentation of numbers and so forth going on. Can we speculate on, on, on the amount of people that are there that might have direct links to this number of 67 that uh, has been reported on since yesterday? I think even what has happened, um, you know, in the way this tragedy. Um, a lot of people have, have phoned the helpline, the international relations helpline. Um, some of them are saying that, you know, no authorities can tell them of, if their relatives' names are on this list. So a lot of Today was about a group of 20 people um, hanging around here, coming to the airport, not because they were told that these flights are arriving, they're coming out of their own, you know, just hanging around, checking, um, hoping, waiting to see if by chance that their loved ones would, would walk through these doors. Um, we don't really have any numbers at this stage. The gentleman that we spoke to, the gentleman communication with. They definitely um, have loved ones who, who were in Nigeria who could be, uh, you know, yeah. the relatives who, who are safe, who haven't been accounted for, but possibly part of, you know, and, and you don't want to say this, part of the fatality number that, that is varying, as you said. We don't have a clear indication yeah. um, of that number. That number could increase, um, and, and that's where we are with the numbers game. And that's why we've seen so many... Uh, well, unfortunately, it looks like we've lost the link with Gillian there at uh, our Tambo International Airport. But Gillian will keep us updated anyhow uh, throughout today. What happens at our Tambo? If there is any developments, if there are any people to talk to, she will do so. Now, just to recap, the world was shocked this week at the news that no less than 67 South Africans died in a tragic building collapse in Lagos, Nigeria. One of the first questions on everyone's minds, however, was... What were so many South Africans doing there in the first place? The building was believed to be a guest house for foreign members of the TB Joshua Synagogue Church for all nations. For those of you who are not aware, Pastor TB Joshua is dubbed the prophet by fanatical followers because of his purported predictions and healing powers and promises to heal the terminally ill. Even boasting with his own TV channel called Emmanuel.tv Network, it was not known how many people were inside the building when it collapsed. But keep in mind that Joshua preaches to massive crowds at his megachurch every week. And according to his website, they host thousands of national and international visitors each year. Over the years, there have been many critics and several Nigerian pastors questioning his methods. But still, thousands flock to him each year. Now, to further this discussion and give us more background on the ways of TB Joshua, we are joined by Dr. Maria Fram Arp from the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Johannesburg, as well as eyewitness apostle uh, Paul Akarigbo, who was in close proximity to the guest house and uh, says he went to the site 
just hours after it collapsed. But before we start with our interview this morning, let's just take a look at the work of TB Joshua. I don't want to use you, but you have a problem. Yes, There's a controversy over a child. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. I want to see. After giving words of prophecy to this man, pointing him to the root cause of his problem, the man of God moves on as Jesus did, ministering prophecy and deliverance to the congregation one after the other. For prophecy brings solution. At a point he came to this woman. Let's hear what he has to say to her. You have to forgive this man. Yes, sir. Because it's too painful. Yes, sir. You know, this is your second disappointment. Yes, sir. Can you forgive? Yes, sir. I will. If you forgive, you have to withdraw the case. Okay, sir. Withdraw the case and put an end to that. Okay, sir. Okay? Okay, sir. Mm. Okay, come on. Come on. Where's your husband? Come on. Come, give me your hand. Where's your husband? He's here with me. You gave him a prophecy. Husband. The woman moves ahead to call her husband. And the husband turns out to be the man, the man of God prophesied to earlier on about a controversy over a child. Indeed, the spirit of God is all-knowing. You know, you were sitting here. Yes. And I was telling you there's a controversy. Yes. Over a, a child. Yes. This is a son. Yes. And you did not answer me. Yes. This is your wife. I met your wife again. The same thing appeared to me. Yes. That there's a controversy issue. Well, we've also been joined in studio now by Pastor Isaka Joharuna Isak, uh, who is a colleague of Apostle Paul. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, better late than ever, they say. You're welcome. Now, if I can start at the beginning... If I can just get your views around the work that TB Joshua does to set the scene. Doctor, if I can start with you. I'm going to look at this from a more sociological perspective. And what we've seen throughout history is that when people are in places of uncertainty, when people feel oppressed, when they feel that they don't have access to the things they need for a good life, then very often people turn to forms of religion that promise them all sorts of healing powers. That's not to say that God doesn't exist. It's not to say that God can't heal. The question is, why do we see so many people going to a place like this? And we find throughout history that when people are under stress, they tend to turn to a, religious, a religion that offers hope. Some say false hope, Apostle Paul. What do you say? You told me beforehand you have had this experience yourself of being healed. Just give us your testimony, uh, as it were. I quite disagree with uh, my, uh, my colleagues here because uh, I don't think he has ever been into synagogue or been to any uh, religious home for prayer or anything. If at all, maybe he has been to Israel. I will ask you a question straight away. Why do many people go to Israel? Everywhere in the world. I will, remain, I will leave that one for you to answer. But regarding the issue of healing, I went to synagogue in 1997. I was tested HIV positive. My mother had 15 children, 14 died. And afterwards, I was decided that I'm going to commit a suicide. I dreamt in the night before the day I want to commit suicide. I saw this white guy saying to me, I will heal you and use you. I said, who are you? I don't believe Jesus. I don't go to church. My father is a serious tradition doctor. He, I don't go to church. I, in fact, I was involved in things that don't pleasing to Jesus Christ. And then when I go to, to know about Timmy Joshua, I went there. He prayed for me. And since that time, 1997, I'm HIV is free. So uh, it is done because people are looking it's for... A, it's a miracle that you are with us today. That's fantastic. That's your testimony. What are you saying to the work that TB Joshua does? Before we start the, the merits of this conversation. Well... The job that TV Joshua does in every era, or I'll call it in every age, every cycle, every 2,000 years, there's a visitation of uh, a being on earth. And uh, in this our era or age, TV Joshua is here. And uh, his service is to humanity, to heal, to assist people in their predicaments, in their problems. 
Does he heal all people? We've got reports from the BBC who've done investigations into uh, Channel 4, done, done investigation showing up a whole lot of fraudulent scenarios. We had rugby players in South Africa that went there. They had cancer. Kibi Joss had told them that you are cured of cancer now. They came back and they died very quickly. Excuse me, let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. Okay. And then we talk about these people don't have faith. No. Why do you then sell this kind of hope to these people and then your get-out clause is you don't have faith? No. It's, I was there. Professor Saka, please, I'm sorry. I was there when these to soccer players you're talking about was there. Rugby players. So. Rugby player. Professor T.B. Joshua have never attended to that guy in the first place. And T.B. Joshua is not a healer. Jesus Christ is a healer. So people, we must not misplace the place of God to human. Okay. So, if let's, is, let's, 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 news, let's, stories, let's park the conversation about okay. whether he does the, the good work or, 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 or not, or whether he's a healer or not. It's not for us to decide in this forum. Let's talk about the people that died, because that is what this story is about. It's about the mil millions of people that are drawn there that are not being looked after properly. A building collapsed. TB Joshua says today that, and I'll quote what, what, what is the, the, the press release that came out today, that this is either the work of Boko Haram, uh, an, an aircraft that flew over the building and sprayed a mysterious, a mysterious spray over the building and caused the building collapse. What is your view on that? All right. Uh, firstly, like you said, it's about the people that died, that don't lost their life, and the people that, people that got wounded there. I want to first of all say, send my condolences to the family members and to all South Africans. Who Please has... answer the question, sir. Okay. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, TP Joshua have made statement on Sunday. Uh, we, this happened on Friday. On Saturday, I and Pastor Saka we flew to Nigeria because we want to actually have information by ourselves what really happened there. And on Sunday, TP Joshua come out on a live TV to say that this. It's an attack, and what happened was that immediately... There, there was no attack, sir. The, 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 we, we saw, saw plane, we can see the video. There was no attack. We see There's no plane. magical spray that yes. you can spray on a building to make it collapse. I, I, I'm not there were sto three I, stories built on top of this building without following the regulations. In Nigeria, in the last six years, a hundred buildings have collapsed. Not one in Nigeria. More than a hundred buildings have collapsed in six years in Nigeria not, okay. because building rules are being flouted and the, it's the security of people are not taken seriously. Thank you. Can I come in in that area? In the... Um in the area uh, the church, Synagogue Church of One Nation is located, there have never been a history of building collapse. And building, when a building collapse, is either slight left, right, or sideways? There's no, there's no, case, there's no scientific way for a building okay, to collapse, if, Okay, have you looked at the, 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 yes, the many World times. Trade Center? World Trade Center, the way the World Trade Center came down. Aeroplanes Did flew into the it? building, sir. Okay, that is good. Aeroplane flew into this. But in this case... Four times an aeroplane hovers around a particular building, and on the four times... Aircraft hovers over, uh, over okay. buildings every day in every city in the okay. world, Why sir? that particular building at that time? Why? Four times. And four times. In every building, everywhere in the world, in every city, we have aircraft above, the, above our buildings. Wh four what times? kind of substance can you spray on a building to make it collapse? Well, I believe the investigation will establish that in due course. We, we hope that is the case, because if... If this is not the case, and you uh, flouted building regulations, and surely you are putting moment, the lies. Just a moment, just a moment. The foundation of this building is capable of carrying 25, 30 stories. The foundation. The, this is speculation. Portion, let's leave that, sir, because you were the okay, person. You excuse me, sir. You were the one who told me now, let's wait for the investigation exactly. before, oh, okay, okay. before we make these fleeting exactly. statements. Right. I want to come to you, Dr. Fromm, and, and, and talk about the scenario, because this is not the first time that TB Joshua Ministries have been involved in a tragedy. Last year, there was a stampede. A church that housed 15,000 people had 45,000 people. Fortunately, only four people died in the stampede in Ghana. How do you put this kind of scenarios in perspective when you deal with this church? It's obvious that they are not putting the safety and security of thousands of people that come there as an absolute priority. Let's park the question of whether God is healing people or not. One of the Christian ideals is to care for people, to provide for them, and the church is not doing that. If the building collapses, you've got to look at how it was built. Secondly, people died. And thirdly, people are grieving. What has the church done to support those who are grieving? 
Okay. How can the church allow so many people into a building that it becomes unsafe? And Christianity is a religion of care and compassion. And I don't see that being exercised given you, that this church you, you makes lots of money from the people who come to visit. Doctor, if I may come in, have you ever been opportunity to visit Synagogue Church of All Nation? I've not been to the synagogue so church, you but don't I've have done 20 years of research into these kinds of churches in Africa. Excuse me, let me come in there. I have been to, I've been going to synagogue since 1997. We have hosted number and number of president leaders around the world. Before any president walk into any building, the security agent, the CIA, every one of them will shake that building before they move in there. We have president living there two weeks, one month. Now, I want to go to your, to your, to your, to your, to your, to your question. T.B. Joshua today have record of over a million scholarship looking after the poor and widow, both, both Muslim, Christian, and every religion. So you don't have fact about what you're talking about, and I'm not going to go into that with you. T.B. Joshua is one of the richest evangelists, televangelists in the world. When? How do you come with that power? This is a, a fact. fact. It's a known fact. It's a known fact. It's a known what, fact. Yes. Who made him to be rich? To Who made him, Who to, made be him to be rich? Yes. Desperate people. Not desperate people. Desperate people, of course. Listen, the Bible said, I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours. Yes, but... When you seek but, the kingdom first. But in this case, desperate Joshua people... Joshua is not out for making money in the ministry. He always emphasized that return what comes from the ministry let me, back to the ministry, let, back let, to the people. Let me, so and that is why... Oh, okay, let, now let me he has... A, let, Apostle Paul, let okay. me come in there. He got, he a contract, the best... Leaders in the world, the best architectural engineering in the world, the best cook in the world, the best builder in Let's, the world. Excuse me, sir. You <laughs> said let the investigation deal with that. Yes. Right? No, no, no. I'm Let's coming to the Let's case that, that she please. said. Let's park that, please. Uh, We're going to wait for the investigation. Okay. Okay. That's we what we decided. Let's wait for the investigation. Yes. Let's wait that for the investigation. I want to come care. to Dr. Frama. Please, don't attack the lady. Okay. So, I, want to, I want to ask you about the rise of commercial religion in Africa. Where does it come from, and is it completely foreign to the African continent. Can I, can I Please. Stop? Okay, okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. The rise of what we call religious tourism is not new. In the Middle Ages, we had hundreds and thousands of people flocking to places where they could get healing. So the idea of people traveling on pilgrimage is not new. Thank you. My concern is how the church is handling those people that have been hurt and those people who've lost loved ones. And this is a moment where you can really live out your Christian message of compassion. What kind of scholarship has been set up for their children? What kind of support yeah. has been given to their widows? It's, okay. It is very clear now, Let sir. Me Wait. Okay. Let me ask the question, Please. then you respond. Yes. It has become very clear that the church refuses to, uh, to accept responsibility for what has happened. The church comes out with a statement saying a magical spray was sprayed over the building and it collapsed. This, this is all part of it. From Friday, it took four days before an official number or rescue workers from other countries could come into the compound and assist in this, in this rescue effort. Why, I ask you? Okay. You introduced me as an eyewitness, right? Yes. Now, you have not been there yourself. I was there. Number one, she asked that if the Bishop was a, a, a Christian or a real of God, what has he done to the people? As a Christian, you don't just speak, you act. The I team asked, of Tim are on the ground in South Africa. I asked they, you a legitimate listen, question. Listen, they, be, they are ground in South Africa. They have been meeting families in South Africa. I, I asked have, you a legitimate question. Okay. Why are you not answering the question? I'm asking, why is the church not taking responsibility for what has happened? No, look, listen, listen. When I was there, the South African embassy, ambassador was there. Please answer the question, he, sir. He did not deny, the he did not deny that the problem. Responsibility exactly. of what is happening did. or what has happened. Exactly. The church has taken responsibility. And it cannot come on air to tell everybody in the world that the church has taken responsibility. We got to do this. If T.B. Joshua can visit Haiti, you heard about the incident in Haiti, the earthquake. He was there with the relief measures. And he gave scholarship to those, for, those unfortunate ones. I'm not asking ones. you about and giving sure scholarships in Haiti. You. I'm okay, asking about this something. incident. Why is TB Joshua not the visible face and dealing with this issue and talking to families and giving hope to people? Where not, is TB Joshua? Is the question. The team on Grand South Africa. Where is TB Joshua? 
Tibi, Where is he? Tibi just had Tima so Ojemi. Tibi just tried to be in South Africa. He is not be the person in front. In he should be the person in front who should be the team, who should be managing the pain and helping the victims and the families team. who are sitting at airports please, please, lost, please, please, waiting for please, loved ones. The question is this. this. How do you expect Tibi Joshua to be in England, be in South Africa, be in Nigeria, be everywhere? And this time he there has, has to been a radio people. and media the silence since Friday. 12.44, this thing happened. We have not seen Tibi Joshua make a statement. Let, let, let me come in there. Let me tell, come in there. Let, me, let, let us not put this to an individual. If you are a human being and you really care about the people that are affected, let's talk about how to uh, arrest the situation and help the family. If the family are listening to you now on TV, what do you think they're going to say? Tomorrow so it will be a week later, somebody. sir. Tomorrow a week people would not know where their families are. President Jokosuma spoke yesterday, the day before yesterday. The, the Minister of Public Relations spoke yesterday. And this issue had to be dealt with diplomatically. She said we cannot just go on We air. cannot deal with this diplomatically. <laughs> families are sitting at airports all around Africa waiting for loved and ones. There's no this diplomacy needed here, sir. We need the church to come forward and tell people what has happened to their loved ones. This it is, is almost a week later. Just, uh, South Africa. South Africa. They are meeting the family. On the 2 a.m. this morning, they're meeting the family, and I will not want to disclose Where? that. It we just Africa. saw 20 families sitting at our Tambo International Airport with nobody communicating with them. I'm not going to go into detail, but I know they're on team, they're on ground in South Africa. They woke until 2 a.m. yesterday. Why are they not communicating with the families then, They sir? made the family. They found the family. I have TV families. Joshua has been missing for a week. No, no, no. TV Joshua is not missing. Uh, He's alive. Your ambassador, ambassador of South Africa was there with him yesterday in Nigeria. The Nigerian government were there. The Lagos State government, the Air Force officials, and all the agencies, including the team that left South Africa, they are on ground this morning in Nigeria. Okay. So this is only a hidden story. We're running out of time. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Listen, TV Joshua the, has the, promised the family the deceased and uh, casualties that he's going to take care of them. And in due time, you'll see this in action. He it? has not. Why must he why come to the public? These people never why come to the public not before they visit that? him. And why has he not been How? visible on television? Team, so you want him to be on the, te on the television to send you to the world? This, is a, man, this is a man who this. claims to see the future. The, ground to do this. the claims to see the future. Why did you then not see Excuse the me, future of this building Emmanuel collapse? Have you watched Emmanuel TV for a couple of weeks? Have you watched Lord, Emmanuel TV? Don't let us If you watch fingers. Emmanuel TV, he's, he's been in for size and things. And besides, TV just is not God. Listen, he's a prophet. Listen, look, he's don't let God. us put fingers. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We've run out of time, sir. I thank you. I thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving us your views, but it seems as if we will not find any alignment on this issue today Africans. because we're screaming and fighting and we are not dealing with the we issue that is fighting, people have the lost their lives and no, there has no. been very little communication with I them, am which is unacceptable. That Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank this you, is not a church. Thank this you. is not a church. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's take a look at what's been happening on social media now. There is the question. Green Monkey asks, where was TB Joshua when this disaster happened? Couldn't you see it? People should stop idolizing these prophets. Trust in God. Amen. Wemba says, if you can see things, question is, why didn't he see this coming? Hashtag TB Joshua. Bekanim Gletcher says, the synagogue only worried about TB Joshua's image while we mourn fellow citizens that were after his miracles. Very disappointed. That is a sentiment that is shared around Africa today. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. We'll be back after a short break.
Welcome back. Time to turn the wick a little bit down here at uh, Newsroom. That was quite a, a, an emotional little, uh, little interview series. But let's move to the clinical side of life, business news. South Africa's headline, consumer inflation quickened above market expectations yesterday, moving to 6.4% year-on-year in August. Yeah, to turn all these numbers for us into words and how it will have direct impact on you as a consumer is Pitman Ruiz from the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you for all joining us once again, uh, Pitman. Uh, we spoke to you uh, yesterday after the announcement and you found it all quite interesting. If you don't mind sharing the thoughts that you shared with us, with the viewers. Sure. So inflation is a very important benchmark for how we're doing as a society. It, it relates to... You know, how well off is your ordinary household? If inflation is high, it means that you have to pay more and more and more for ordinary goods. You have less to spend on non-essential items like luxuries. So high inflation equals bad, bad times. Bad news. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the fact that it's 6.4 is significant, given that South Africa has an inflation target between 3 and 6%. Yeah. As long as inflation is between those two poles, it's a good thing, because then it's more or less under control. Manageable. Yes. So if the inflation goes above 6% and, and perhaps returns, yeah. it's Let's not... Let's just have a look at... at, sure. uh, at uh, this is year-on-year -year consumer price index. Is that right? Or almost. Uh, we're looking at the last a graph of the last six months, or almost a year, is it? Yes. Yeah, just over a year. Six, six, yeah. So you can see it's so been... We, we're hovering just uh, above the six points, which is starting to get into the red zone, really. That's right. And the problem is that if the trend continues upward, um, then we're moving into very, very dangerous territory. Uh, inflation talk is, is worse affected, um, affects the poor. The worst. The worst, because yeah. it's food inflation and it's core inflation. It's, it's the basics that really exactly. gets, uh, get, is affected. But, but why are we seeing such a high inflation rate now? Is it on the back of protracted strikes? What, what has pushed this up in the last quarter? Mostly it's exchange rate and, and foreign commodities that we import. South Africa is a small economy, so we're very dependent on the rest of the world. Yeah. We, we saw the graphic there of the repo rate. What's the cor correlation between repo and inflation, and how does it affect us? Sure. So the, the Reserve Bank has to manage the situation, like you said. If inflation goes up, they have to increase the interest rates, and the decision is today whether yeah. they will. Um, and that is to protect the currency and so doing to protect... So tell us about this currency. announcement by the Reserve Bank sure. and, and what it means. And, uh, you know, we see the numbers, but put the story to the numbers for us. Well... Uh, there's a, there's a strong possibility that they might increase today. Um, and that means that we will have to pay more on our mortgages. Yeah. Um, and that reduces the money supply in the economy. And doing so reduces demand ultimately. So that's the way that you can counteract inflation. Yeah. Well, that's not good news for all of those of us that not own properties, uh, Pitman, unfortunately. Another uh, topic or big story on the international uh, uh, news today. We see a landmark referendum in the, in the United Kingdom. Scotland, Scotland wants to, uh, independence. Sure. How will it affect the South African rand and the South African economy going forward if there is a yes vote? Uh, very little. Very little um, because I, I think we have very strong ties with England so our investor profile won't change that much. Uh, it is an interesting development though so uh, we'll have to watch what happens there. Well, Pitman, thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us and telling us about this. Uh, you know, the way people reported it here in South Africa, it felt almost if they vote yes in Scotland that our co economy was going to collapse. But you bring us good news, as always. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> That's Pitman Ruiz from the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, giving us his views on, well, the quickening of headline consumer inflation and how it affects you. If, it owns a if you own a house... You might pay a couple of hundred rand, maybe up to 500 rand more in the months to come. Now, the World Travel Awards are held annually to acknowledge, reward and celebrate excellence across all sectors of the global travel and tourism industry. Now, this year, Cape Town was voted Africa's leading destination and Africa's leading cruise port at the World Travel Awards of 2014. And to talk a bit more about this exciting news, we're joined today in our Seapoint studio by Cape Town Tourism CEO, Enver Dumini. Good morning, Enver. Thank you for joining us. Morning, Evan. Two international, or shall I say, another two international world travel awards this year. Uh, Cape Town's doing, a bit, uh, doing something right, but uh, 
Uh, aren't you getting sick of getting awards? <laughs> No, even I don't think we'll ever get sick of, of, of receiving these accolades and awards, uh, whether it's from uh, the World Travel Awards, the industry themselves, or even just from visitors to do TripAdvisor. What is it that so Cape Town we're is... definitely not sick of it. What, what is it then that Cape Town is doing right then? <laughs> sure, what are we doing right? I think it's a myriad of things. Um, there's, of course, the natural beauty we have as a destination. There's an interesting culture and a mix of those cultures. Um, but for me, it's also a bit more than just, you know, uh, the pretty pictures. It's about making sure that what we sell as a destination is actually lived by and executed by a professional and collaborative um, and also committed tourism industry. So as Cape Town and Cape Town Tourism, what we do is we kind of connect visitors, tourists with industry product and also with the support of local and provincial government. I think it's that through those collaborative efforts that make sure that this destination is one of the most sought after destinations in the world. And I want to talk about uh, the other provinces in South Africa. It's a beautiful country that has so much unique to offer. How do you as Cape Town then use your popularity, for lack of a better word, to try and connect the rest of the country with the people that come to your shores? Well, interesting enough, I think if we go to some research is that what we found is that international tourists actually visit at least two provinces. So whether they go to Gauteng first and then end up in, in Cape Town or they start their journey in Cape Town and end up in Durban, it's through those gateways that we allow then, you know, travelers to connect. And it's uh, about the positioning. But more importantly, I think if we look at South Africa, is that each province, each city, each town has something unique. It's about putting those um, interesting things together and packaging it smartly and then of course using um, all our channels whether social media, um, anything online or through traditional media and promoting our, our offerings to a global audience. So I think it's, um, you know, if you're South African, I mean we are extremely blessed. Imagine trying to do all, all that South Africa and Cape Town has to offer in 10 days. And I think that's what makes people come back is that they, they, they can't experience everything and it's because the first experience was so amazing that they come back and they, of course, influence others to also come to our destination. Enver, I want to talk to this thing about being the leading cruise port uh, on the continent. Now, I grew up in Cape Town myself, and there was never a cruise ship in sight when I grew up in Cape Town. It always seemed too far away from the rest of the world. Where does this thing come from, and where do you cruise to from Cape Town? Well, interestingly enough, I think if we look at it, it's the location of the, the current cruise terminal, and um, it's in the, probably the biggest and the most um, sought-after attraction in Africa, which is the, the V&A waterfront. So I think it's because of that location that, you know, um, ships are coming in. Um, we've seen a few also disembark from here. But also because there's a harbor there that can also assist with some of the maintenance required for the ships, um, which, again, is interesting because, again, that's part of the economic spin-offs from cruise liners. And because of that, the city and the province, uh, along with the V&A waterfront, are going to invest um, into creating a dedicated terminal um, for cruise liners. So this is all part of the bigger picture for tourism. Now, Enver, on a, on a more serious note, as if this isn't serious enough, Ebola is a real threat in Africa now to tourism, and, and we see that, uh, you know, the rest of the world sees Africa as a whole. Um, has it affected tourism uh, in Cape Town? Are people complaining that occupancy rates are maybe a little bit down and people are not booking so much for the upcoming peak season, or, or is it business as usual in Cape Town? Well, I think, interesting enough, it's not business as usual. Um, we've, when we've spoken to trade, once we've heard about the Ebola and the impact, um, trade actually advised it that there's um, cancellation in your bookings. What are you going forward? Specifically from the Asian markets. And if we understand the Asian markets, I mean, they were affected by H1N1 virus, bird flu, etc. So they're a lot more cognizant of the fact of health issues that would affect their, you know, their citizens. So they act a lot quicker. And, you know, the, the concern for us as a tourism industry is that, you know, this will take long for us to recover from because, again, irrespective of whether, you know, Cape Town is like almost 6,000 kilometers away from affected areas, which is probably the same distance from, let's say, Mumbai to Paris. You know, for, 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 from a perception perspective, we know that people look at the content, like you rightly said, as a country. And our job is to kind of address those inaccuracies in the media with the social media to proactively start addressing it by putting out the facts. Um, you know, to say, for example, you can't get... Ebola through the air, which unfortunately was made popular through, you know, movies in the late 90s like Outbreak. Yeah. So, you know, these are challenges for the industry, but I think if we look at South Africa and Cape Town and the tourism industry, I think we bounce back quite well. 
Um, we've gone through a lot tougher things. Um, if we go back two years, there was the Ash Cloud incident that affected travel. And these are all par for the course. So I think it's um, a bit concerning for us, specifically from the new markets where we're going into. But if we look at our traditional markets, uh, where a majority of our visitors still come from, the Ebola hasn't really affected them, or at least us from a destination perspective. Well, Enver, you've got your website uh, right on, uh, on screen right now. Just tell us quickly what people should be looking out for on there. Well, um, I mean, to, people want to go to our website. It's www.capetown.travel. And we have a myriad of things from, you know, letting you know what the latest events are, what's happening in the city. Um, we've got platforms where we allow locals to actually talk about the city um, through their voices and their experiences. Um, we leverage social media by pulling all those streams into our website. Um, we also tell you what the coolest places to do, what to do when it's raining in Cape Town. Um, you know, there's so many things to do that's for free as well, so it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Enver so I think for us it's um, you know, a platform where we have a lot of locals as well as international visitors coming to and about an average of 100,000 visitors to that website per month, of which about 50 to 60 percent is domestic. So Enver, it is the, you know, the port of call. Yeah. To, uh, to get you off script quickly, before we go, you've yep. got 15 seconds to tell me, is it still safe to walk around in Long Street after 2 at night in Cape Town? Well, if you're going alone, we always tell you it's, you know, go together, rather go with people. Um, you know, it's as safe as you want it to be. This is a problem in all major cities. But, you know, always ask your concierge, contact Cape Town Tourism where we can advise you. And, you know, I think it's being a lot more mindful. And, you know, common sense sometimes is not common. Um, so we always try and proactively advise tourists okay. and travelers um, through the industry to be safe. Thank you very much for joining us today. Enver Dumini, the CEO of Cape Town Tourism, doing a fine job in selling one of the best destinations in the world. Thank you for joining us. Well, let's move on and take a look at what's on social media right now. Uh, it says there, Gabriel Taylor says, England is scarred of Scotland breaking away, or scared rather, of Scotland breaking away. Its main asset will no longer be in their control. North Sea Oil, vote yes, Scotland, says Gabriel Taylor. Yes, that's what it's about, I suppose. Capital Trend says, Scotland prepares to vote on the fate of the United Kingdom. Scotland decides today. A landmark day it is. Brief says, with best wishes to all our good and old friends in Scotland on this day of all days. Whatever happens, however it goes, thinking of you. Brief solutions, that one. Well, now shifting our focus to Pretoria. Cool Capitals, world's very first uncurated Gorilla Biennial is apparently happening in our very own capital city here in South Africa. It's an exhibition of ideas by Pretoria's residents that offer them the opportunity to rediscover over the over 100-year-old city. The program includes different events that offer a wealth of art, architecture, urban and graphic design exhibition, as well as performances. Well, it all only draws to a close on the 16th of November. That's still two months almost, which also happens to be Pretoria's birthday. Now, here to tell us more, we are joined by the organiser of Cool Capital's Open Foundry events, Ilani Willem. So, good morning, Ilani. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely to be here. Just tell us uh, exactly, I said a mouthful there, what is the, exactly is the DIY Gorilla Biennial, is it right? Well, um, the thing with Cool Capital is that it's community-driven. It's... Um, a celebration of creativity organized by people from the community. Um, this entails a, a vast amount of art exhibitions, um, music concerts, film festivals, and everything is organized by the community. Um, uh, the other part of the Guerrilla Biennale um, definition of Cool Capital um, is that everybody is donating their time, all the organizers, all the project coordinators, directors, everybody is doing it completely pro bono. They're giving back to the community in a celebration of art and trying to inspire change. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Just tell us the type of events then. Who can people expect to see what they should be on the lookout for in the cool capital as well? Well, like I said, there's, well, there's more, I think more than 100 events taking place. Um, among this, there's a documentary on the architect Norman Eaton, which uh, debuts next week, Wednesday. Um, there's an open foundry day. There's a rooftop exhibition curated by Gordon Froud. There's a lot of pop-up gal galleries in the inner city, rooftop film festivals. Um, there's really a lot happening, so I can't really just mention one. 
uh, yeah. Those are some of the standout ones. And you know, in today's world, people are more connected. They think, I think people are more disconnected than we were before because of social media. They say they are more connected to things and people want to be more connected. How can people then be part of this project, be part of this celebration? How do people become connected to it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the idea is that people um, take in initiative. It's a community-driven thing. So um, a lot that's happening is uh, based on like a, a cultural exchange or um, a skills exchange kind of thing. One example that I can mention is the school project. Mm. Um, artists from around Pretoria are collaborating with some of the schools in Pretoria and they're basically guiding them along the, the way to create a public sculpture on their school grounds. And everything is done by the students and by the children. Um, and the artist is basically just teaching them to look at their environment differently and mm. um, helping them develop a concept of what they can do on their school grounds. And, and, and I'm particularly interested in open, the Open Foundry event, which is the one that you're involved with. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that event. Um, Pretoria has a very rich um, artistic heritage. Um, we've got Anton von Vaux, Eduardo Vela. Some of the museums in Pretoria host the biggest art collections in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, in, early in the year, we had a meeting where a lot of the sculptors from around Pretoria came together. And yeah. then um, after a little bit of a discussion, we thought of the idea to host a, a foundry day because Pretoria has a lot of individual foundries across the city. Um, so we, we host the oldest foundry in the country, which mm -hmm. opened its doors in 1931, mm -hmm. uh, Renzo Vignali. Um, there's a lot of academic institutions that give sculpture as a, uh, well, on a tertiary level. Mm -hmm. um, the first foundry exclusively run by women is also... And they grow uh, as productive and they grow uh, uh, You have demonstrated that once again in your state of the nation as you and ourselves to manage the new and trusted administration of democratic South Africa. You outlined many challenges that you will observe in the course of uh, election years and many of us have observed well on the ground. You have uh, indicated very clearly that we require to express both in the work and more importantly in action a uh, greater sense of urgency in the state of how we address people's concerns, be they residents within the city or village, be they businesses, small or big, that operate within our cities or rural areas as well, or be they businesses to our country. Today we hope that you will, and I'm sure you will, give us your thoughts and vision for South Africa, not just 20 years ahead, but in the next year or two. What we as a local government constituency, which includes uh, representatives of provincial governments and administrations and other national departments and their as well, what we could do to fulfill your vision, what we could do to express publicly your passion.